short while ago, we pondered the video game bosses that started out looking harmless and non-threatening before we started fighting them, only for them to reveal a final form that looked something like what the designers of Godzilla's enemies would call a bit much. Turns out we were only scratching the surface, and that plenty of you had suggestions of your own for bosses who you'd think twice about squaring up to if you knew what they were going to turn into. Here are seven of our favourites. Enjoy and beware spoilers for the following games. <laughs> I was starting to wonder when you might notice us. Who are you? Me llamo Ramon Salazar, the eighth castellan of this magnificent architecture. I have been honored with a prodigious power from the great Lord Sadler. I've been expecting you, my brethren. No thanks, bro. Bosses that transform into horrible flesh cathedrals are such a Resident Evil thing that, to be honest, we're amazed that we managed to only include one Resident Evil boss in the last video. So, we made ourselves a certificate. But this is a whole new video, and as such, we've got a Resident Evil quota to fill. So, we're going with commenter Mr. 371312's suggestion when they say, Just came here for that little dude from RE4 and his boss fight being the most annoying. The little dude Mr. Numbers is referring to is Ramon Salazar, the diminutive old man-faced 20-year-old who dresses like he's on his way to Elton John's birthday party. Ramon is a tiny D-bag who spends most of his on-screen time in Resident Evil 4 getting totally owned by Leon Scott Kennedy, both verbally I've sent my right hand to dispose of you. Your right hand comes off? Hmm. Say whatever you please. Die, you worm! And physically. Sure, he's got his weird xenomorph bodyguards, but if this thing ever comes down to a one-on-one -on -one fight, it's going to be a no contest, am I right? Leon's going to suplex Ramon in half in like 10 seconds flat. Ah, you just missed her. The ritual is over. She left with my men to an island. Yeah, not now, Ramon. I've got actual bosses to go and fight. Like Krauser. Have you seen that guy? Knives all over the place. But just when you think you're going to pick up Ramon and punt him into the sky like a football, he gets picked up instead by the giant parasitic plant monster thing behind him, along with his bodyguards, who don't look super thrilled about this turn of events. Now, Ramon is basically piloting a grim flesh mech covered in horrible, harmful tentacles, but, like a good Resident Evil boss, has handily also covered himself in big, squishy eyeballs, which, while great from an aesthetic standpoint, leave a lot to be desired in the vulnerability to gunfire department. Goodbye, Ramon. We barely knew you. And we're fine with that, to be honest. You're really annoying. The other knights that hero Shovel Knight has to face in his quest to stop an evil enchantress may seem intimidating, sure, but I think you're forgetting that Shovel Knight has a shovel. Ever been hit by one of those? Exactly. One enemy you won't be worried about when you first see them, however, is the diminutive Tinker Knight, an engineer and inventor who spends most of his time tinkering, as his name suggests. But you'd be wrong to underestimate Tinker Knight, as pointed out by commenter Sam T. Bandit, who says, No word on Shovel Knight? Specifically, Tinker Knight, the opponent that goes from flailing screwdrivers and legitimately tripping in battle to being one of the most powerful and impervious bosses in the game. As Santee points out, the initial stage of your fight with Tinker Knight is pretty unimpressive. He spends the whole thing running around in circles and flinging wrenches at you. That's when he isn't falling flat on his face, that is. He also appears to be either sweating heavily or crying? Honestly, neither would surprise me. Anyway, Tinker Knight is easily beatable in this form on account of your aforementioned shovel. But once you do so, the floor gives way, you fall down a hole, and it turns out that Tinker Knight has been working on some inventions for exactly this kind of situation. 
Enter this giant mech with a huge lance, spiked armor, caterpillar treads, and the ability to fire bombs and missiles seemingly indefinitely. Now I'm kind of regretting just bringing a shovel. Although the battle mech is totally impervious to your attacks, Tinker Knight, who is driving the thing, is not. Now, instead of dodging a series of hastily flung wrenches, you have to dodge the barrages of military-grade ordnance being flung your way in order to actually get into a position where you can whack Tinker Knight in the head with your shovel. I don't know, Tinker Knight. I feel like maybe you should have led with this instead of the wrench throwing and the crying. Just a suggestion for next time. Five square blocks smashed into rubble. And at the center was me. Alive. But changed, but no one could have seen what was coming. Cole McGrath from Infamous 2 is an impressively capable video game protagonist, despite looking like someone just hit all the default options in a WWE character creator. This is going to be a short-term visit, man. We're just going to get in, I'm going to get some new powers, and then we're going to come right back. He's got electricity powers, psychic visions, can control the weather, and has what is, hands down, the most elaborate backpack I've ever seen. <laughs> Took you a while to find me, boy. So you'd think that it would take a lot for an enemy to worry Cole. I mean, who knows what he's got in that backpack? Could be a chainsaw or anything. But don't let Cole's powers lull you into a false sense of security. As noted by commenter Joshua Mormon, some of Cole's enemies are more powerful than they first appear. You all really didn't put Joseph Bertrand from Infamous 2 on here. The Joseph Bertrand in question, Joseph Bertrand III, is an old man with a suspiciously modern haircut, who has seized control of the city of New Marais, despite apparently not being able to sort his collar out properly. No, Cole. I think we're both demons. Our pride has turned us into monsters. Come on, Joseph. Collar inside the jacket. Still, Joseph has got an evil scheme and a terrible hairdo, so Cole readies up the lightning powers to see if he can blow the rest of that hair off, at which point you might want to reconsider your aggressive stance on account of how Joseph turns into this. Cole! Get on the back of my truck, man! <coughs> We're gonna lure him out of here! Yes, what was once a frail old dude is now a freaking Gears of War boss, and I don't know about you, but I left my Hammer of Dawn in my other messenger bag. The fact that you've got to get on the back of your mate's truck and hightail it in the opposite direction as fast as possible should give you some idea as to just how this boss fight goes. You have to keep running away and hitting Bertrand from a distance because if you go toe to toe with this thing, Cole's gonna be deader than, well, the infamous franchise. Just kidding, I'm sure we'll see a sequel soon. Not enough bloody and shit. My flail. Bring me my ah, what stops ears? It's a little known fact that things that look nice and normal but then turn out to be horrible monsters was the working title for Dark Souls. In the end, the choice of title came down to that, Dark Souls, and just f you in big letters on the box. Anyway, a good example of at least two of these potential titles is the character of Sister Frida, who you'll encounter in the Dark Souls 3 Ashes of Ariandel DLC. As commenter Sean Fisher notes, sorry, you're gonna have to make a new list and include Black Flame Frida from Dark Souls 3. However, Sister Frida doesn't look like she's gonna give you much trouble when you first encounter her in the painted world of Ariandel. She is an initially friendly NPC who, as far as we can tell, just wants to be left alone. And thy duty lieth elsewhere. Return from whence thou camest. I presume it visible to thee? The bonfire here in this room. And despite leaving things alone being a perfectly sound strategy for staying alive in a Dark Souls game, heading down to the church's basement reveals that Frida's got Father Ariandel tied up down here, and to put it mildly, f is f up. Cast thou not see the flame flickering once again? In good surge, I can see it, feel it. It's at this point that Frida comes down into the basement, only now she's got a scythe and seems a lot less friendly than she was a second ago. I would snuff out these ashes for good. Sure, her scythe does frost damage and she can turn invisible, but at this point, she's not too much of a hassle for you to deal with. 
Defeat her though, and Father Ariandel, who up until this point was just chilling at the back next to his blood bowl, goes absolutely berserk, sets everything on fire, and resurrects Frida, and now you have to fight both of them at the same time, which is no fun whatsoever. I mean, apart from the fact that Father Ariandel still has his chair stuck to his butt. That is pretty funny. Anyway, finish this fight and surely you're done, right? Wrong, because guess who's back? Back again. Frida's back with Black Flames. Yes, Frida's third and final form, known as Black Flame Frida, is the toughest of all. Here she wields two scythes, one coated in Black Flame, which makes it deal way more damage, the other wreathed in frost that causes heavy frostbite damage if it touches you. She's also super fast and constantly doing massive area of effect attacks that hit super hard and are really hard to avoid. Still not sure they made the right choice of title. For another example of a From Software game with a misleading title, look no further than Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. Totally inaccurate. I've died hundreds of times. And many of those deaths were at the hands of our next suggestion, as offered by commenter Ibrahim Hassan, who says, The Guardian Ape in Sekiro threw me off guard. I was all, alright, that was fairly annoying, but then it just had to get back up and blindside me. At first glance, it might not seem like the Guardian Ape belongs here, on account of how his first form is actually already pretty damn terrifying. He's huge, fast, and capable of absolutely wrecking you with big flailing swings of his arms that look like someone trying to quickly remove a jacket they've realised has a wasp in it. He can also hit you with massive body splashes from miles away, flings his poo, and does huge area of effect farts, all of which are good reasons to avoid hanging out with someone. Eventually though, you're able to defeat the ape by decapitating him with the sword that was stuck in his neck. At this point, you'd be forgiven for thinking that's the end of it, on account of how the ape's head is no longer attached to his body. The ape has other ideas though, and gets back up, arming itself with the sword that you just used to decapitate it in one hand, and its own severed head in the other. Probably a bit late to apologise and try and smooth things over at this point. Anyway, this second ape form is a completely different beast, moving differently, attacking differently, and armed with a host of new terrifying special moves, including one particularly memorable one, where it puts its head back on its neck hole so it can scream at you. This scream can kill you instantly if you don't get out of the way in time. Hey, at least he stopped farting. Every cloud. And so you return. Lovely Morrigan has at last found someone willing to dance to her tune. Such enchanting music she plays, wouldn't you say? People who played Dragon Age Origins will surely remember Morrigan, either for her incredible command of shape-shifting magic or her heavy sarcasm. Take your lectures elsewhere. They mean nothing to me. Someone they may not remember is Morrigan's mother, Flemeth. Someone who definitely does remember her, however, is commenter Myths and Legend, who says, No Flemeth from Dragon Age Origins. She's a frail old crazy lady living in the woods and then suddenly a giant frick you dragon. It's true, first impressions of Flemeth are that she's not physically super impressive, on account of how she looks more likely to offer you hard candies than a hard time in a fist fight. Greetings, Mother. I bring before you four Grey Wardens who... I see them, girl. Hmm. Much as I expected. However, Morrigan eventually asks you to kill Flemeth to stop Flemeth from taking over her daughter's body. Possibly to put her daughter in a more sensible top, but there's really no way of knowing. When her body becomes old and wizened, she raises a daughter. And when the time is right, she takes her daughter's body for her own. At this point, you'll have two choices. Let Flemeth fake her own death and leave, or stand your ground and team up with three of your heavily beweaponed friends to fight this frail, unarmed old woman. Let us skip right to the ending, shall we? Do you slay the old wretch as Morrigan bids, or does the tale take a different turn? You can probably guess where this one is going, hey? Well, you'd be right, because if you choose the fight option, Flemeth uses her shape-shifting powers to turn into the giant frick you dragon that commenter Myths and Legends spoke of. All I can say is, I hope you like being on fire. You don't? 
It damages you badly. You probably should have let her go in that case. Well, if it isn't Saucy Jack. Just a little too late, as usual. The final boss battle in Metal Gear Rising Revengeance is between Raiden, a cyborg ninja made out of swords, and Colorado Senator Stephen Armstrong, a tubby older gent in comfortable slip-on shoes who looks like he could be played by Kevin James in a movie adaptation. And yet the fight is not as one-sided as it initially appears, as pointed out by commenter Bobby Bruton who says, How about Senator Armstrong? First you're like, ah, a pretty standard non-cyborg American senator. Then his body starts crawling with nanomachines and he kicks your cyborg booty right back up into your ribcage. Yes, at first glance, the Armstrong fight seems like it's going to be a pretty straightforward affair. Sure, he's in the Spider Mech from Wild Wild West, sorry, Metal Gear Excelsis, but this is Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. Raiden spent the entire game slicing things like this into tiny pieces, like a chef chiffonading some champignons. He isn't going to break a sweat, and not just because all of his sweat glands have been replaced with throwing knives. At this point, you're probably imagining that the worst of the fight is over. I mean, what's Senator Armstrong gonna do now? Start filibustering about how robot ninjas shouldn't kill senators? Oh, you've gotta be kidding me! Uh, or, okay, this is new. Probably pretty easy to get your spending bills through if you can do this. Yes, as Bobby pointed out, turns out Armstrong has another trick up his sleeve. The fact that he's enhanced himself with nanomachines that harden in response to physical trauma, making him basically invulnerable. Probably still worth checking though, Raiden. Maybe try punching him 1,000 times. luck. Maybe try another thousand? Well, I'm all out of ideas. Eventually, you get an assist from a robot dog because this is Metal Gear Rising Revengeance and stuff like that happens all the time, and you're able to finally defeat Armstrong. But it's a real slog and definitely much, much harder than we were expecting when we first discovered the game's final boss was going to be a middle-aged American senator. Now, the governor of Colorado is going to have to appoint an interim senator until a special election can be held to find Armstrong's successor. Did you consider that at all, Raiden? No, 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 you save it for Colorado Governor Jared Polis. That's his weekend plans out the window. There we go. Those were yet more transforming bosses who made us regret our hubris uh, in battle. Um, thanks for your suggestions and thanks for watching. And if you'd like to watch something else from outside Xbox, why not check out this video about the fighting game characters that were so weird or kooky or otherwise not really that popular, they were never invited back to a second fighting game instalment. And maybe uh, check this one out from outside Extra. This one is about... What is it about? It's about... Don't tell me. It is about... It'll come to me, James. I hear you laughing back there. No, it's about... Um, uh, just click it and... Th it's, there's a thumbnail. It's what it, it's about what the thumbnail says. Read it. It's that one. Aren't you intrigued? Watch that one.